You're going to be starting us off, Chimwama. Hello, uh, my name is Maura. Uh, welcome to today's Digital in Saka. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you all and many thanks for joining. Please do let us know where you are joining us from today in, in the chat. So the first talk for our Nsaka today reflects on the role of physics research in African development. Fundamental sciences have a deterministic role in technology development, which is tied up to socioeconomic development. Recently, joint efforts have led to the emergence of several scientific research excellence centers in Africa. Physics forms the basis for most of the natural and applied sciences and technology. Therefore, a crucial starting point is a good quality education in physics. This cannot be achieved without being involved in innovative projects at the cutting edge of science. The need for intra-Africa and international cooperation in research became pressing as knowledge is now becoming crucial for economic development. Both science and gender equality are crucial for achieving the sustainable development goals. This uh, first talk will give a brief overview of the physics involvement in Africa, a discussion about women in physics research in Tunisia, and finally an introduction to Butaina's theoretical physics research activities. Our next talk today reflects on the scientific aims of the SKA. South Africa is one, is one of the host countries of the Square Kilometer Array, the SKA, which will be the world's largest and most sensitive radio telescope, providing us with a glimpse of galaxies in the early universe. The tremendous scientific promise of the SKA is counterbalanced only by the massive challenges involved in its construction, commissioning, and operation. South Africa, in its construction and operation of the Meerkat Pathfinder, is already finding many of those challenges. In particular, transforming the deluge of raw data into high order, high quality data products, uh, products require a paradigm shift in conventional radio astronomy computing, forcing us to embrace the cutting edge and data intensive techniques. Therefore, radio astronomy is at the nexus of the promises and challenges that are core drivers of the fourth industrial revolution, which further presents opportunities for us to develop techniques, skills, and a talented cohort of young scientists who will straddle the scientific and data-centric domains. In this talk, Bradley will present a broad outline of the scientific aims of the SKA and highlights of Meerkat, and will focus on South Africa's um, focus on a data intensive astronomy, which places our community at the forefront of the fourth industrial revolution. Our first speaker today is Professor Butaina Kerkeni. Uh, Butaina is a professor of physics at ISAMM University, La Manuba in Tunisia. She is currently a senior visiting fellow at the physics department, University of Oxford, as part of the Africa Oxford Initiative senior visiting fellowship program. And our second speaker today is Dr. Bradley Frank. Bradley is an Associate Director for Astronomy Computing at Inter-University Institutes for Data Intensive Astronomy, Southern African Radio Astronomy Observatory, and UCT Astro. So just to give you some information about the format of today's discussion, the speakers will each give a 15 minute talk in succession. The Q&A will take place after both talks have been delivered. Please remember to post your questions in the chat box on YouTube, but if you prefer to submit your questions anonymously, you can use the Slido option. The Slido link should have now been popped into the chat box on YouTube. So first up today, we have Butaina, whose talk is titled, The Development of Science and Physics in Africa. Welcome, Butaina. Thank you, Mora, for this uh, kind introduction. Um, I'm going to share my, my slides. I hope you can see them now. 
Yeah, so uh, through this presentation, I'm going to uh, give a broad overview of science development and, and physics in Africa with a focus on uh, physics and research in Tunisia. And in the second part, I will present my uh, computational studies that uh, uh, have been part of the uh, collaboration with astrophysics department at Oxford University. First of all, I'm going to introduce the Tunisian universities. Tunisia has got 15 public universities, among them the two following ones, University La Manuba, which is founded in 2000. It has 10 institutes. ISAM is one of them where I do my teaching, one faculty for humanities and literature, and three cooperation institutes. Then University Tunis Manar, founded in 1987. It has two faculties, Faculty of Sciences of Tunis, uh, where I uh, lead my research group there, and two engineering schools and nine institutes. My research activities are in the domain of computational chemistry and physics, uh, performed in the condensed matter laboratory, uh, condensed matter physics laboratory at Faculty of Sciences of Tunis, University of Tunis in Manar. I use code develop, I use quantum uh, chemical software and uh, develop codes as well for uh, kinetics uh, and prediction and also chemical reactions. My applications are in the field of astrophysics, in particular uh, predicting infrared spectra for uh, molecules, which I will be uh, talking about later on. Also application in atmospheric chemistry for redux, uh, reduction of nitrogen oxides in the uh, exhaust gases of vehicles, enzyme catalysis for energy and materials, and also nanotechnology modeling. So my presentation has two parts. The first one is an introduction, the uh, broad overview of science parasites in Africa and the possible solutions for the for the future. And the second part will concentrate mainly on the uh, modeling of the uh, infrared spectra of polycyclic aromatic uh, hydrocarbon molecules using computational chemistry tools when we extend the calculations beyond what exists already in the literature above 400 carbon atoms in these molecules. So, uh, <clears throat> first of all, um, Africa uh, is a vast continent, the world's second largest land mass. It has 54 sovereign countries, 1.3 billion people, speaking more than 2,000 languages. Initially, um, the developments in Africa, be it in education, economy, or politics, were uh, originally along linguistic lines, and focus was mainly on manual work. But post-independent African countries found the need to open more universities and educate people in science and technology. To do so, basic sciences have a major role in the social economic development of a country, and physics formed the basis for most of the natural and applied sciences and technology. Therefore, um, international cooperation became urgent. Also, promoting gender parity and science play a very crucial role in the uh, achievement of the sustainable uh, development uh, uh, of the continent. So, first of all, or the case of Tunisia, a historical um, overview. Tunisia got its independence in March 1956. At that time, Tunisia has got 90% of illiteracy and extreme poverty. However, just after that, Tunisia became the first country to abolish polygamy and women have the right to vote uh, since 57. Tunisia is very active in the fight against violence towards women. During the 20 years after uh, independence, the two main uh, development axes were along education, which is compulsory since the age of six and is free, and around the personal statute of women and men that are equal by law. So um, the interest in uh, university uh, studies uh, uh, started in the 60s, where we see the uh, foundation of uh, Faculty of Sciences in 1963, and up to the 80s, some scientific research in physics uh, can be seen. From the 80s to the uh, 2000, the uh, percentage of female students exceeds that of males, and from 2004 to 2008, uh, Tunisia has got 40% of its university professors and 47% of its researchers are females. As of 2010, PhD female students um, over, um, uh, is uh, higher than the, uh, that of uh, males. 
And uh, as of the UNESCO science report, 77% of uh, graduates are females. Still in 2020, we can find two of, out of three students are females in higher education. However, national funding for scientific research is uh, very insufficient, leading to high percentages of unemployment. So the science uh, perspectives in Africa uh, have uh, focused on uh, uh, specific research fields since the 90s. We can see excluding South Africa, theoretical and experimental theme film research, geological sciences, and also astrophysics. The current state of science development shows the existence of several centers of research through the whole continent, more than 1,200 universities, several observatories and solar energy centers, wind solar power generation and nuclear research activities for health, environment, food and agriculture applications. And a thorough report can be seen in the following reference. Uh, we can see also several excellence centers uh, emerging in Africa, apart from uh, the uh, African Physical Society, the African Astronomical Society, with, which uh, role is to promote science uh, for uh, uh, students and to uh, deliver uh, good education, uh, high quality education, the Organization for Women in Science for the Developing World, uh, which uh, uh, was founded in 1987, and the new hub for the ICTP, which is the IFA Institute in Rwanda, uh, whose role is to uh, organize and pursue PhD and master programs in physics. Three African uh, uh, research hurdles face uh, the uh, uh, research in Africa, which can be uh, split into three points, excessive teaching and administrative to, uh, loads, uh, isolation, so lack of proper mentoring in research, lack of research infrastructure in institutes, and paucity of uh, industry and research and development, limited resources, be it in computational or experimental devices, access to journal paper, and mainly low spending on scientific research. Um, research, science, and technology are passed to making Africa more prosperous. Unfortunately, um, the uh, global shares, for example, in the Sub-Saharan Africa has increased by only 0.1% from 2014 to, to 2018, which corresponds to a density of uh, 124 researchers by million inhabitants as of 2018. But despite the small global share, several African countries had increased their research density per million inhabitants by more than 15%, as uh, is the case of uh, Mauritius, followed by Ethiopia. Some possible solutions to overcome these uh, uh, short, short uh, coming, um, uh, problems uh, would be sharing teaching resources online and engaging volunteer visiting lecturers, uh, pairing African researchers with excellent researchers in the developed world, sharing available resources um, within Africa and uh, from outside Africa, for example, joint computational facilities. Uh, now I'm going to move to my uh, presentation regarding the computational studies uh, I have performed in collaboration with my colleagues uh, at Oxford University. First of all, I will introduce what is an electromagnetic uh, spectrum. It is the range of all electromagnetic uh, radiation that uh, uh, ranges from the gamma rays through the, uh, the, the visible, for example, the light coming uh, through a lamp, uh, through the infrared, which uh, 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 corresponds, for example, to radiation uh, coming from dust particles between the stars, up to the radio uh, waves, for example, uh, the, the, uh, the um, uh, radiation the, uh, coming from a radio station. So uh, the uh, electromagnetic uh, radiation is uh, uh, the light that uh, travels and 
uh, uh, spreads uh, as it goes. It can be expressed in terms of energy in electron volts, wavelengths in meters, or frequency in hertz. Usually, we uh, place telescopes in orbit, and that's uh, to uh, avoid the uh, uh, the uh, absorbs of the atmosphere of the, the air. So, um, an example of uh, uh, Dust particles that emit this infrared uh, radiation are polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons which are composed of carbon atoms and hydrogen atoms as well. They can be, they are observed in uh, uh, outer space in many sources in different galaxies and they, uh, they have different shapes. These are example, uh, an example cartoon around the atmosphere of a carbon rich star where you can see that these molecules can uh, can be uh, represented by benzene rings uh, to up to uh, graphene sheets and uh, uh, further more complicated the dust particles which are uh, carbonaceous uh, larger grains and uh, the uh, these uh, uh, the emission infrared emission from these grains maps the dust between the stars it determines star formation rates in galaxies which is one of the key indicators for understanding galaxy evolution. Also dust particles um, are part of a complex chemistry that uh, might explain the origin of life. This is an example of an infrared uh, spectra uh, of power molecules observed with the ISO space telescope, uh, which has uh, three uh, ranges. Uh, lower than four microns, we have bands, between four and nine microns, and beyond nine microns, we have also other bands attributed to these power molecules, these polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Uh, these are examples of computational uh, spectra of small uh, polycyclic uh, aromatic hydrocarbons from the NASA database compared to experimental uh, spectra, infrared spectra for the small for the, for the small molecules. The database comprises up to 384 carbon uh, power molecules. Uh, however, the ratio between the 6.2 micron to the 7.7 .7 micron band is a size indicator for the large power molecules. And from observations with the Spitzer Space Telescope, it is inferred that large powers belong to galaxies with black holes. That's why we have extended the investigations with the collaborators to investigate large power molecules up to 1,500 carbons using computational chemistry tools. And uh, for this, uh, and this becomes urgent with the launch, recent launch of the James Webb Space Telescope with its high resolution and unprecedented sensitivity. This is an example of uh, the mid-infrared spectra we have computed with the uh, quantum chemical uh, tools uh, for the case of the 1500 uh, carbon molecule, which I show here with its uh, hydrogen at the, at the edges. And uh, this uh, work has been recently published in the monthly notices of the Royal Society. Uh, so um, finally, I, I will move to some ideas for Africa that has got uh, uh, the uh, large po population of um, young uh, people. So these uh, need to be have a, a good uh, uh, education in physical sciences. And uh, um, the uh, United Kingdom has excellent researchers and good research facilities. So probably sharing and collaborating either remotely or in person would be very beneficial for the transfer of knowledge. And now I move to the, uh, to the end. So I would like to thank the AFOX team and the senior African fellows, my colleagues at the Astrophysics Department, University of Oxford, the Fell Fund, uh, and the HPC, uh, the High Performance Computing Europa 3 program to perform these uh, heavy calculations, and Prof. Omolulu uh, Rwanda's IFA director for insights uh, um, focusing on the, uh, on the statistics uh, of the development of science in Africa. And we would like, like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Putaina, and, and thanks for your talk and for bringing into focus the importance of physics and the development of Africa, outlining the history and progress of 
physics research in Africa, but in Tunisia more specifically, and for introducing to us um, what you've been working on in your in your research, uh, which is fascinating. Uh, we are looking forward to the Q and A portion of the Insaka, so please remember to submit your questions to both uh, Butena and Bradley using the YouTube chat box or the Slido link if you would like to ask your question anonymously. So we will now move on to Bradley and his talk is titled The Era of Data Intensive Radio Astronomy. Welcome, Bradley. Hi, thanks, Maura. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, that's perfect. Okay, awesome. Well, I want to thank the organizers of this Digital Nsaka for inviting me to give a talk uh, on my research. Um, so, so the topic of my research is the, the era of data intensive radio astronomy. And I really just wanted to focus on uh, the sort of research that, that took me on a, a visiting scholarship program to, to Oxford in 2019. Um, and so a lot of this is done in collaboration with my colleagues at the Department of uh, Astronomy at, at the Oxford University. Um, so a little bit about me, uh, I have uh, a PhD in astronomy from UCT. Uh, and I did a postdoc in Astron at the, uh, in, in Netherlands. I returned to South Africa to work uh, as a lecturer at the astronomy department. Uh, I'm, I'm now an astronomer at the uh, South African Radio Astronomy Observatory. Um, and more formally, I've been seconded as the Associate Director for Astronomy Computing at, at IDEA. And as I mentioned before, I was a fellow at uh, St. Peter's College in 2019, and I was a recipient of the generous uh, Africa Oxford uh, Visitors Grant. So this is a picture of me and, and my very first radio telescope, which is in probably the worst place for a radio telescope ever on um, the, the rooftop of the Witz Physics Building in the center of Johannesburg. But that's where I got my start uh, at radio uh, astronomy and I've been at it ever since. Uh, so this talk focuses on Meerkat and the SKA. Uh, in, in particular, the mighty survey in which I, I spent quite a lot of my time. Um, and so I'll try to talk about Meerkat's idea and the data intensive astronomy research that I've been doing. Um, and, and it's largely just focused on, on the singular pursuit that we all have, which is just to go out, do our observations and generate images like we have on the right here. So the, the white contours show the, the, the radio emission or the, the neutral hydrogen emission in this, in this galaxy. And you can see that there's, there's it traces quite a lot more than the visible extent of the stellar um, emission that you would usually see if you just look through an optical telescope. And so looking at the radio gives you a tremendous amount of information that you wouldn't ordinarily have by just looking at an optical telescope. So the SKA stands for the square kilometer array. Um, so the, the, the story is that a, a few eminent radio astronomers did a back of the envelope calculation in the late 1990s and came up with a number to detect the, the faintest galaxies, the faintest, most distant galaxies in the universe. And that number was a square kilometer. So you would need um, the equivalent collecting area of a square kilometer of dishes to detect this really important cosmological signal. And so this is how the SK was born. Um, and the science cases have since grown into Obviously, the most strongest um, aim of the SKA, galaxy evolution, study of cosmology and dark matter. But we can also time pulsars. We can also test Einstein's theory of gravity. Um, we can study cosmic magnetism. So where do these magnetic fields arise? Look at the cosmic dawn. And we can also look for extraterrestrial life. Uh, and South Africa is the home of the SKA mid. So this is the dish portion of the telescope. And we expect to have some form of SKA operability in, in about 2025. So to build a radio telescope, you can, you can build it to get that square kilometer of collecting area. You can achieve it in a few ways. So one way is to build these massive single receptors, which is done in, in China. So this is the 500 meter aperture spherical telescope. So this is a single aperture from end to end is 500 meters. But it's rare to find space to actually do this. You can build a few larger single apertures and connect them up. This is the Hart Tobias Hook telescope in the bottom right. Um, and so you can build a few, a few of them, but you can imagine that it becomes expensive 
to run them and to and to build and to industrialize the entire process. Or you can do what we've done in in South Africa with the Meerkat telescope. So this is 64 dishes. This each one of these dishes is 13.5 meters in in diameter, in effective diameter, and we have 64 of these in in the Karoo. So Meerkat stands for More Kuru Array Telescope. So Meerkat was initially conceived as a 20 dish telescope and we got funding to operate it and to build more uh, telescopes. And so we have 64 dishes at the moment. So this, this configuration that we have, is we have the sub-reflectors removed from the center of the pointing, uh, from the center of the aperture of the, of the main dish. So that's called offset Gregorian. Um, so we have 64 of these dishes. Uh, distributed out to a maximum physical baseline of eight kilometers. And we have at the moment two operating frequencies, it's frequency bands. So L band, which goes from 900 to 1677, which is where I do a lot of my research. And a full polarization, full bandwidth, a full observation of Meerkat will generate about 24 terabytes of data over eight hours. So we're currently engaged in full science opera operations. And this includes a few of Meerkat large survey projects and many smaller, but also significant open time projects. My research focuses on the radio in, in particular, but, but in general, my uh, multi-wavelength studies of galaxies. Uh, and and the, 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 the main survey that I'm involved in at the moment is called the, the MITEI survey. So this stands for the Meerkat International Gigahertz Tiered Extragalactic Exploration Survey. The, the PIs are Matt Jarvis and, and Russ Taylor. Um, I'm the co-chair of, of the um, Mighty H1 working group. So we are looking at blind, untargeted observations of H1 and galaxies. So essentially, what I'm trying to depict on the right here is that we have this semi-regular uh, placement of, of pointings and we essentially detect all of the galaxies that are in that pointing. And this is chosen to overlap with multi-wavelength surveys. And so this is blind in the sense that it is not targeted on, on, on pre-selected galaxies a priori. We just go and look at patches of sky and we reduce the data and what we find is what we find. Uh, so it really is the census of galaxies in the truest sense. And so neutral hydrogen, uh, H1, it's a basic building block for galaxies. It's really the fuel for star formation. It's uh, the easiest thing that the universe can make. Uh, it often traces the full extent of the dark matter halo. And so this is what you're looking at on the top right here. This, this rainbow image here shows you the motion of the galaxy, of the gas in the galaxy relative to the center. And it shows that we can actually, if we, when we go and study the distribution, the kinematics of this, gas, we can deduce quite a lot about the mass in that galaxy, but also the dark matter. And in the bottom right here, I'm trying to depict what a single nearby galaxy looks like when you look at multi-wavelength view. And so when you combine this with multi-messenger astronomy, you can really get a, a detailed view of galaxy evolution. So our survey has been very productive. This is something that I worked on while I was in Oxford. So, uh, so on the left here, this is this black and white image is the SDS is an SDSS image of uh, so it's an optical image of galaxies in the field and all of these red contours are H1 detections and so we found a a group of you know larger than average galaxies so galaxies with quite a lot of H1 that are, that's in the process of of merging uh, we discovered uh, NGC 895 or NGC 891 um, so this galaxy that has been perturbed by a close encounter with, with a companion. And my uh, PhD student recently produced this paper where she looked at the, the size of H1 disks as a function of the mass of H1 disks and found that they follow a, an extremely tight correlation over almost three orders of magnitude. Uh, and this is quite profound because it, it shows that there is a underlying um, sort of physical law that governs how these disks actually assemble themselves. And so something very, very interesting about the angular momentum that governs the formation of these large galaxy disks. But for us to get to these wonderful and fantastic science outcomes, we have to crunch through a huge amount of data. So the science is only possible with large scale computing. And this is the, this is the, the, the crazy thing that we didn't anticipate when, we, when the SKA journey started, that uh, 
because of the large number of telescopes and because of the great sensitivity we would achieve, we were now in the big data game. So as I mentioned before, Meerkat generates three terabytes worth of data an hour. You can imagine that that's three laptops worth of data each hour fold all the way to the top. So you can't actually use a laptop anymore. Uh, at IDEA, we have a, a few large survey projects and each of them observe for thousands of hours each. Generating, you can imagine, quite a huge amount of data. We also have dozens of smaller open time projects, each of which generate about dozens of terabytes worth of data themselves. Uh, and so this is why we've had to develop you know, quite a novel um, approach to data processing. We, our, our cluster at the moment comprises about uh, more than 100 nodes um, that is distributed over CPU and GPU processing. And we also have a few high mem nodes as well. Uh, and this is essentially split up into, into three different forms of computing for our users. So we have uh, a Sloan cluster, which does quite a lot of heavy lifting and quite a lot of uh, data intensive uh, uh, processing. We have a Jupyter uh, hub where our users can come along, explore data, try out algorithms. Um, and then we have Carter, which is our visualization software that we use that's being used all over the world. And we currently provide about five petabytes worth of storage. I think this makes us one of the largest academic um, data, data stores in Africa. Um, and so essentially this, this, is, this is the use case. They just essentially are storage, uh, storage driven um, and storage constrained. So you can imagine that moving this data, a terabyte worth of data per hour is, is an incredible challenge. And so we, it's not just moving data from, um, from one building to the next, it's really moving data from the Karoo which is about 1500 kilometers from Cape Town all the way to Cape Town and then presenting that data to our um, astronomy colleagues all over the world. So the data itself has to be combined for it to have any form of correlated meaning. And that's done in our supercomputer in the Karoo. That's then moved over to a supercomputer in Cape Town. And that's where we store our um, a variety of data products. When we're ready for the data to be analyzed and processed, that's staged on a small machine, and then that's moved over a fiber optic network to our cloud-based machine where our researchers essentially don't really know what's happening under the hood. They just log into the system using their laptop and, and process. And in reality, this is what's happening. So we have a support model that brings researchers into our infrastructure and our scientists essentially is just logging onto the system by their laptop and they have no awareness of what's happening under, underneath here. They have access to their data and a full ecosystem of tools um, and they just move around, move data around and move tools around in the way that they would on their laptop. And so we have, uh, as I mentioned before, a full ecosystem of tools um, and we provide a, a spectrum of, um, of modalities that's available to our users because the use cases are actually, um, are, are, we need to be flexible to different use cases for different, uh, for different scientists. Uh, so, so this is maybe a little slightly more complicated view of what's happening, but essentially um, the, we, the model that we wanted to create for our users is one where the, the user doesn't really know what's going on underneath, but everything is connected in a, in a really, in a cutting edge way. So we have our distributed storage at the bottom, which is driven by Ceph. Uh, we have high-speed uh, uh, um, network switches. Um, and then we provide a full spectrum of, um, uh, of, of um, computing to our users. That's collected by a head node, for example. So the user just connects to these, these different services in, in a fairly straightforward way. Uh, and so this is, this is an example of, of what this allows us to achieve. So, so at the top here, this is an example. This is a, a back in the day before COVID when my students could actually sit in a room and work together. This is all of them logging onto our system and, and doing you know, some fairly hardcore simulations, each of them running their own instance. And essentially they're doing something like what is being illustrated at the bottom here. They're doing a combination of visualized multidimensional data, but also analyzing that data in real time. And so this is, this would not be possible in the old paradigm where you would have to have a closet server, your own machine to do your own single experiment. Here we have a distributed system 
and it it really is you know easy so easy to use that that our second year undergraduate students can log on and do fairly sophisticated stuff on the system. Um, so this is my last slide. Uh, really here what I'm trying to capture is that um, the modern paradigm of radio astronomy is, is distributed and data intensive. And just, it has to be distributed because science is driven by an international community. So the, the, the notion of having a centralized computer somewhere uh, is outdated and, and inefficient. So the, the SKA modern science is really driven by what's referred to as these international SKA regional, regional centers. An idea right now is what we would refer to as a prototype of this SRC concept. It brings the data and the services to the scientist. So even if you have, if you're a scientist and your, your, your main aim as a scientist is to, is to achieve that radio image, you have to engage with this highly complicated system and our job is to make that system appear as seamless and as simple as possible. So it has to be flexible enough for scientists, scientists, but cutting edge enough to deal with this huge volume of data, but also to ensure that we can keep up with things like Moore's law. So on the one hand, we have different use cases, for example, we have to have high performance computing, but we also have high throughput computing. And so this is essentially the paradigm that we're working on now. Um, so this is my last slide, and, and this is what I'm working at the moment. And once again, I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for giving me this opportunity to talk about my research. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Bradley, for your talk and for outlining the work that you're doing and kind of this new paradigm um, for data and, and using kind of big, big data, which I think is quite exciting. Uh, so we'll move on to um, the Q&A portion. I'll, I'll go back and forth between Bradley and Butaina, but I'll start um, with Butaina. Um, I think, uh, I, I mean, as you know, um, the audience for the Afox in Saka is quite a broad range of audiences, including, I think, social scientists like myself, who maybe um, don't quite get the nitty gritties of, of the physics and the science. Um, so I was wondering, and I think that's related to the point that you were making about the importance of physics, whether you could talk a little bit about the work that you do in relation to um, how it could be applied perhaps to some of the socioeconomic um, problems that um, Africa might be facing today and in the future. Um, and related to that, in fact, we have a question from an audience member who's asked, um, could um, the science be applied in healthcare um, using smaller telescopes to guide minimally invasive surgery? Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, first of all, let me say that um, a good uh, education and uh, uh, that is based on, uh, on um, very, uh, a very uh, clear description of the phenomena and the transfer, dynamically transfer the knowledge without, uh, without complicating physics that would be the first thing to attract the students to do uh, science and uh, the importance of physics uh, in uh, the social economic development of a country that can be uh, can be uh, uh, achieved through um, uh, through uh, the um, uh, the use of uh, uh, of, of tools that can be uh, applied to modern science so that if you, we don't have upgraded uh, computer systems or if we don't have upgraded uh, experiments then we cannot uh, compete uh, internationally in uh, in publishing our our research so that's uh, something uh, to be uh, uh, sure about so uh, we have to have uh, access to uh, good quality uh, um, resources in order to be able to uh, to reach the level of uh, of com competition and uh, the level of uh, de developing uh, science and uh, and uh, um, apply it to a specific uh, challenging cases to each uh, part of the of the continent. For example, uh, uh, I don't know, um, like. Um, satellite programs uh, to investigate uh, the drought and to share the data uh, 
uh, among the different countries so they can benefit from these uh, from this knowledge and uh, extrapolate it to their specific problems to fight against the drought or uh, the uh, um, or um, uh, yeah so um, uh, to transfer also the uh, the education to the uh, to the remote regions of the of the of the continent Thanks, Katarina. Um, and another question um, here. So someone has asked, um, so science is intimidating um, and that there is perhaps a greater influx to IT since it might be considered cool. Um, how do we make science more generational friendly to encourage greater enrollment by young uh, Africans? I know that you've mentioned that perhaps making it more accessible might help, but do you have any more suggestions for how it might be um, more friendly and encouraging for younger people? Um, yeah, uh, well, Mm, through, for example, the, the, the Excellence Center in East Africa, there are training programs and uh, uh, networking that is very active and that uh, can uh, lead to uh, uh, the uh, young students to connect together and to, uh, to share their, uh, their thoughts. Uh, that is a melting po point, a uh, uh, melting point. Uh, uh, um, Part for this uh, for these uh, young uh, researchers to uh, uh, to put their hands on and to uh, uh, to access the uh, uh, access the um, uh, well access the um, uh, facilities and be able to uh, to uh, tackle cer certain subjects uh, directly, dynamically. So it's not just through equations, etc., but uh, tackling a project, uh, uh, trying to, to solve it, and then uh, go uh, uh, um, each one on its own to, to look at the at the lectures and to uh, to get more insight on, into the uh, into the uh, the basic. Uh, 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 basic uh, equations, let's say, or uh, principles. So that's uh, one point. Uh, also, uh, enhancing the collaboration and partnerships uh, among the different countries uh, can tackle these uh, challenges. Uh, for example, to uh, uh, to accelerate the innovation development, and uh, this would uh, greatly enhance uh, the strength of our science systems and our ability to contribute to national and uh, African social economic priorities. Great, thank you, Butaina. Um, so I think a point um, that was made in Butaina's research, which I think links with Bradley's um, talk is the point about maybe kind of inequalities between research and access to resources in the global south and in the global north. Um, but Bradley, I think what struck me is you spoke about this, this new um, paradigm that you're using that um, focuses on making it more kind of flexible enough for scientists to use. So kind of prioritizing the scientists and making it easier for them. And do you, do you think that there are any potentials in there for that to, to allow more African researchers to maybe access to, to resources or ways of doing research that they might not have had before? Uh, so that's that's a great question, and 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 actually it's 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 quite relevant. So so there's there's a few initiatives that we have. So there's the the Dara Big Data Initiative that um, I think it used to use Newton funding. Uh, so it's it's also supported by 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 UK as well. So essentially, this is to develop skills in in the data sciences uh, across Africa. So essentially, we would um, run uh, hackathons big data skills development workshops um, at various high, high, um, um, higher education institutions across the continent as well. We also have a program where our Center for High Performance Computing um, shares some of, our, uh, some of the computers that we have to, to help people develop skills in uh, HPC applications. Um, we also have quite a lot of uh, African astronomers who are using our idea system to access um, data at the Meerkat data or um, essentially the services or the full suite of services that we have on our systems. Um, I think we can leverage off the technology and the access that we have here and present something for our African community. So we have strong engagement with the African astronomical community um, especially as it's aligned with 
you know, we're hosting the IEU General Assembly in 2024. And so quite a lot of our activities are to build um, expertise and inclusivity and participation in African instruments across the, across the continent. Um, one of the biggest sort of barriers to entry that we have, it sounds a bit, um, a bit trivial and, and a bit silly, but it, it is connectivity and access to the internet. So your services can be decentralized, but really what, what's required is that you have a really good high throughput and really high, highly reliable access to the internet. Um, and, and that really enhances your experience when it comes to logging into the systems. And this is why, you know, we, we can try to provide as much access to our African partners as possible, but bandwidth is an issue, access to, you know, having a, a reliable Wi-Fi at, uh, uh, at an institution is, is also super important. Um, and so what, we, what we're hoping to do is to take this model that we have uh, to conceptualize it, um, you know, as a prototype, and to ship it over to some of our African partners so that in the very least, they can have local instances of what we've built here. Um, but that, that requires quite a lot of um, interoperability from our African partners as well. And we have to build quite a lot of um, knowledge around doing that. But we have a roadmap and, and, and hopefully this is something that we can achieve in the next five years. Sure. I think before I move on to the next question, you've made the point that, I mean, the, 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 uh, one of the barriers to entry being connect connectivity, and I don't think it's trivial at all. Um, I think it affects so many other issues, kind of, for example, if you think about young people looking for employment and they can't get connected to the internet to be able to look. Um, but what do you think, uh, have you thought around what, come, what kind of solutions we might be able to look towards? to improve connectivity or what opportunities are there particularly for researchers to intervene and kind of try to move this issue forwards? So in my ultimate paradigm, I think that I would, I would probably tap into um, uh, sort of cell phone providers and network providers uh, who have a tremendously huge uh, footprint throughout Africa, right? So um, I think what we found especially over the last few years where learning was decentralized from a university, especially, well, in South Africa, for example. And so all of a sudden what happened was that we had to decentralize all of the services that were available to our students. Uh, we had to move those services away from, from campus. And essentially what happened was that um, cell phone uh, network providers came to the party and started providing you know, data plans for our students, you know, high throughput data connectivity for students as well. Um, our university started subsidizing some of those, uh, uh, you know, data bundles for students as, uh, as well. And I would really want to see sort of more commercial partnerships with um, our commercial partners in the African community uh, to create this sort of research backbone. Because at the end of the day, this, the, an uptake in skills and skills development, it enhances the bottom line of commercial, you know, cell providers, uh, it creates um, it creates a, a new market, and so I think the return on investment is, is is tremendous. And I think that if if honestly if, if this was something that that um, I had the capacity to to do, I would go down knocking knocking on doors and ask for um, for for our um, network uh, providers across the continent to help us with. Um, uh, academic uh, connectivity uh, to the internet. Thanks, Bradley. Um, I think uh, one more question for you is, so I think you've outlined um, quite well what the new possibilities of taking up this new paradigm are um, that's more distributive and data intensive. And I was wondering whether, whether from a scientific or socioeconomic uh, perspective, what sorts of innovative ways have people been able to use um, this or what you imagine people might be able to do with this in the future? Uh, well, so, so that's, that's an interesting question. I think, I think what's, what's, uh, uh, when, when the, uh, the idea of the SKA came across um, in, in South Africa, uh, one of the big questions was, you know, what kind of impact is this going to have just generally on the South African community? And I remember at the time there was this sort of, vague hand wavy thing that there would be you know quite a lot of knock-on benefits benefits to actually hosting this this telescope and and what that really meant was that it would create jobs you'd have to build a telescope you'd have to build the infrastructure 
uh, and it would create quite a lot of short-term benefits. What we're beginning to realize as sort of the, these themes around the fourth industrial re revolution, you know, really started to gain momentum in the, in, since 2010, for example, is that data science, connectivity, and de decentralization of computing, storage, and infrastructure, it, it really becomes the way to go, especially in Africa, where you have, you know, basic infrastructural issues such as, you know, low shedding, um, unequal access to, to internet connectivity and unequal access to, you know, basic um, business services, for example, that you would need. So essentially what we've done with this, with in, in our journey to actually just making radio images, for example, we've had to put together a, a set of highly robust systems and infrastructure that are really, really robust against many of these issues that we've been dealing with uh, in our country and in our continent. And I think this is really something that we can ship to, to our commercial partners and we can ship to our communities. The sense that we are creating something that is so tremendously robust against all, any form of upheaval and at the same time achieve really high quality data science or, and science throughput as a result of what we put together. So I think essentially we, what we need to do is take this model that we've developed, you know, um, package the lessons that we've learned. Obviously the road hasn't been totally smooth. We've made quite a lot of mistakes along the way and we've learned quite a lot about our limitations from a technological perspective. But we've also learned about how to overcome some of those, um, some of those challenges. And I think as a community, we need re to reach out beyond our you know, tiny ring fenced uh, domain and reach out to our partners uh, in society and to say, you know, this is a model for how we could, you know, bring intellectual services to the, the broader community so people can access um, things in a more robust way. Thanks, Bradley. Um, yeah, so I think quite a lot of themes of kind of sharing um, and collaboration, which is something that's also come out in, in what Butena was saying. Um, but before I go on to that, Butena, so what um, when you were talking, you highlighted that there were quite a lot of women who were um, entering scientific fields of research and graduating from science with with science degrees. Um, but what I wondered was what are the what are the outcomes for those women after they've finished university? You did mention that there's a high unemployment rate. So if you could speak a little bit more about that and what the solutions might be. Um, and in addition to that, um, there's been a question from the audience that's, uh, which asks, it appears the current state of women in science in Tunisia is high. How can it be translated to other African countries? Is there a magic model that can work and help more women go into science careers? Yeah, uh, that's very uh, um interesting question uh, it's uh, and it's a very uh, hot topic because uh, unemployment is uh, not only a local uh, problem uh, in tunisia but it's uh, widespread in africa uh, i didn't get the second question you you, you mentioned so the second question was um, about how can uh, the high rate of women entering science fields be translated into other African countries from the Tunisian experience? Well, well um, uh, first of all, the, uh, uh, the interest in science uh, came from uh, um, political will, which, uh, which uh, is uh, uh, trigger for um, uh, enhancing equality and uh, uh, gaining this uh, sustainable uh, uh, development of, of, the, of Tunisia post-independence. Uh, and that was something uh, we gained and we, 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 uh, uh, we have uh, very much uh, developed in, in a sense that uh, uh, women want to uh, achieve uh, um, important uh, roles in the society and be uh, an active part uh, part of it and without uh, being focused and uh, prioritized tasks because it's more, more difficult for women than men so uh, the uh, the main point is to prioritize and to know how to uh, uh, to focus on uh, on uh, every uh, everyone's uh, career because uh, um, because it's very easy to uh, to um, uh, to learn and to develop uh, 
each one's uh, scientific career when we are young and we are eager to uh, to learn etc so we have to we have to uh, take uh, advantage of uh, of uh, these uh, experiences from the Tunisian society and uh, to be independent to have uh, 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 I mean independent professionally and also uh, uh, how do you say like uh, you are a, an active part in the development of uh, the of the country so uh, and the um, importance of um, of, of learning and developing uh, science is uh, um, is, uh, is something that uh, does not uh, faint because I, the more you ask for knowledge, you more you the more you foster it and you more you make it uh, bigger. So that's uh, uh, something very important to think for uh, the future of uh, uh, of a country with the the. Uh, uh, the parity between uh, the males and females, and um, so uh, that's uh, that's an advice for uh, for the young females to uh, to be uh, to follow in order to uh, uh, to be an active part of the society and uh, of the development of uh, of the country. The problem of the employment is uh, is a major one because. Uh, uh, let's uh, put it uh, uh, clear that uh, uh, science has to be uh, part of the culture in order to uh, in order to to be um, um, uh, to be um, uh, <clears throat> uh, developed and to uh, um, uh, so that uh, we we can we can have uh, the, um, uh, um, uh, focus on developing science in a in a country. So uh, it is very uh, crucial to um, um, to um, uh, to have uh, this uh, um, help from uh, uh, from the uh, decision makers to put more money into uh, scientific research so that uh, uh, so that the um, the, the, the country becomes uh, independent and has uh, and relies on its uh, own uh, scientists in order to develop uh, its system and to uh, create uh, uh, jobs uh, through uh, R&D and, uh, uh, and, and try to, uh, to be more open because uh, the main uh, and major problem uh, as a consequence of the lack of uh, funding, the, uh, in, I mean, the um, the scientific uh, jobs after a PhD are mainly uh, focused on uh, teaching activities and no more research, uh, innovative research is developed. Uh, let's put it uh, clear that uh, uh, it's very difficult to uh, keep uh, track of uh, uh, very um, uh, innovative and up-to-date research without any uh, uh, like uh, access to uh, uh, in my case, for example, uh, high performance computing. I mean, you limit yourself to, uh, to systems uh, that are uh, archaic, that have already been st studied in the past, and you cannot be competitive and you're, you're not going to publish. publish. So uh, that's uh, a major problem in, uh, in, uh, in Tunisia. High performance computing is not something uh, that you can, uh, that you can you have access to. So, uh, mm -hmm. So these are the main issues facing um, science scientists uh, when they graduate, and uh, so they they have uh, limitation in uh, in their career prospects. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Patina, for for yeah making that very clear and outlining what the issues are. Um, so since we're uh, running short on time, uh, and as I've highlighted, I think something that's kind of common in, in both of your talks is is highlighting the need for more collaboration, sharing of resources and knowledge. And so in closing and starting with you, Bradley, I wondered whether you'd give your final kind of reflections um, and if you would reflect on that um, common thread as well. Uh, so, so I think, I think that, uh, I think this is, this is why the, the, the Africa Oxford scholarship and exchange program was really valuable for me because that gave me the opportunity to to do a sabbatical and to actually focus on research that had, you know, tangible impacts on my own research throughput. Um, 
So, so I think um, programs like that, and I think that having, you know, making a um, concerted effort uh, towards having partnerships, especially across the, the continent as well. I mean, Bettina just mentioned that, you know, high performance computing in, in Tunisia is not, it is, is, is not like easily available. Um, not that, that we have all the answers in South Africa, but we, we certainly, it's certainly on our radar and certainly important. And so that, that's also, she mentioned political will, and I think that's also very important as well, because these things require funding, it requires expertise, it requires willingness from academics, stakeholders, uh, and the community uh, to move those things along. Uh, and I think that through engagement, especially if we include, um, you know, higher education stakeholders and to get them to see that, you know, there's the African continent can indeed be competitive from a science perspective, but we do need access to resources and we do need to create uh, ancillary competencies within our, com within our countries. Once that message gets into their heads, um, they'll be able to understand that to nurture science requires partnerships, requires competition, but requires investment into ancillary um, partnerships, but also uh, facilities within each country uh, that basically just enhances our scientific throughput. Um, I think that we're on the right track. I think we're starting to make the right no noises, but I think that it requires quite a lot more interaction, engagement, and collaboration, and talking about the science um, for it to happen. Thanks, Bradley. Uh, and Butaina, your final uh, reflections for today. Um, yeah, this was a really uh, very interesting uh, interaction between uh, Brad and, and me and uh, all the questions that have been raised. Uh, I think that uh, the, uh, the take home message is uh, sharing, opening, uh, opening our uh, data systems to each other among the countries. Uh, so that will be first step uh, that Africa has to rely on just uh, uh, start to develop our, uh, uh, our abilities to uh, and push the boundaries of our thinking to create new ideas and to, uh, um, to share them again among, among uh, each other. The transfer of knowledge through workshops or uh, also through uh, scientific short scientific meetings in the different scientific centers in, in Africa so that we can create more and more uh, 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 network beneficial for the young people to take uh, advantage from and uh, now there is no any more uh, language barrier between our countries we all uh, uh, speak uh, English you know at university level so that, that, that's not any more a barrier uh, in Africa so uh, we can definitely build something uh, good for Africa and uh, I am very positive for the future. Brilliant thank you. And with those two messages of comprehensive support and online sharing that brings us to the end of today's Digital and Saka, I would like to thank the speakers, uh, Putaina and Bradley. Uh, and I'd also like to thank the audience. Our next in Saka will be a hybrid one. We are looking forward to seeing members of the AFOX community again in person. And we look forward to more fascinating discussions with our digital audience continuing online. So please be on the lookout for more information about the next in Saka on our social media and on our website. Goodbye for now. And thanks again for joining.